right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM coming to you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Jonathan Tuttle, who is in Chicago. And Jonathan's the fund manager and head, head of acquisitions at West Park Capital in Chicago. How are you doing, Jonathan? Very good, very good. Not as uh, not warm like where you're at, but still uh, still doing all right. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm sure. I'm sure. You're sure, you're getting a bit of snow up there. Um, yeah, we but, actually uh, yesterday was the biggest snow of the year. We had like five or six inches. So. Oh wow. Oh, uh, well, sure. The kids at least it gave something for the kids to be excited yeah. about. God knows they've had a tough enough time of it. Yep. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't think about that, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is how to raise capital during an uncertain and challenging economy. So, Jonathan, you know, let's let's get straight into it. Um, what are the number one? What are what are some of the challenges facing people about raising capital right now? What are maybe some of the capital sources that would normally be available or that would be more easily available that have kind of um, shut off to people right now? Yeah, great question. I think uh, the biggest challenge is. Usually trade shows and face-to-face -face meetings, trade shows are usually the easiest opportunity to get deal flow and also meet people, take them out to dinners, get in front of the ideal prospect in whatever niche you're in. Uh, that's, you know, that's dried up. And then you also have that disconnect because even though like we're on the Zoom call, you also have a demographic or people, a large percent of people that have been forced to learn this, but the trade show platforms, I mean, they're trying to integrate like networking, but it's still not the same as face-to-face -face and like, I did a couple of trade shows or went to a couple of different trade shows. And like, even though the platforms are nice, there was no connecting with anybody. Like you can't, can't do like a virtual dinner or anything like that. So that's one big challenge. And I think also, obviously with a lot of restaurants, California, Illinois, the same thing where you normally, you know, take people out face to face. So it's a lot more building relationships digitally, obviously, but you lose all that face to face and those network type meetings. So yeah, no, absolutely. So then, um, how do you compensate or overcome that? And where are some of the areas? Where are some of the ways that people could look at to access capital? So on the contrary, you use the technology to your advantage. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it, as long as your demographic or your audience is in front of it, uh, Facebook ads have been very, very powerful. The data is really good. LinkedIn ads, it's not the data is not as you can't get as granular, and the targeting is not as good, and it, it's not as robust as Facebook or Google ads. And then finally, Google Ads is one of the best platforms. So basically just having a like a really good online presence, follow up with the retargeting and like ad roll on different platforms. And just basically, whether to like a Zoom call, whether to like a sales call or even like a webinar. So basically using those advantages with the technology. Then right now we have, you know, if you're doing like a 506 Reg D, you could, you could advertise online. That's one of the key proponents. So we're lucky in an age right now where we're allowed to use technology. So it's all technology focused mostly besides like traditional mail and stuff like that sure and are there are there new or different um uh, different types of capital or different ways of, of accessing capital now that uh, were maybe were not as popular or not as well known before the pandemic and now are becoming something to look at i think the one thing i've noticed is uh like the single family office has becoming a trend the last five years i didn't even really know what it was until i started raising capital and i've I guess they've like doubled or tripled in the last like four or five years, family, single family office, especially. It's basically pulled together like very ultra high net worth families where they have a whole team, whether it be lawyers, financial advisors, everything all in one place instead of relying on 10 different people. Uh, it's a great place to look for capital. Typically what they look for though, they're looking for more exclusivity. Uh, it depends, single family office is smaller, usually around 50 million. They'll usually write checks between one, three, and five million, and then family office is usually hundred million plus, and it's like billionaire families, and uh, but they mm -hmm. typically write like five or ten million, and they're a lot of times not even looking for deals or fun type stuff. They're looking for more like one off, like hey, we're going to partner with you. you, you know, these are our terms, and we'll write the whole check for us, and like you, you basically get to, they did dictate the, what they want, and then you just basically work with them. So we're seeing a lot of that happening, uh, a lot more prevalent than it used to be. Yeah, and and then it, so if you're going to go after um, single family offices or family offices, then it sounds like um, you have to be open, obviously, to a to a real partnership, yeah. and uh, you know you have to have all your ducks in a row. I mean, you have to do a lot of prep work before you go in front of somebody like that, right? 
Yeah, exactly. And like their information is not as abundant. So it's like, you have to kind of go through barriers and they have like, you know, basically people that kind of look and see if the opportunities make sense. There's a couple of resources out there that paid sources. We're looking in a couple of them where you pay them like a percentage or a marketing fee and they'll get you in front of the people or there's like aggregated data where like they have all the, the sources. Um, but then there's also one other thing I forgot to mention, broker dealers. So broker dealers mm -hmm. is another angle. If you, uh, depending on how you structure your fund or if you're raising capital, you could, it's basically, it's kind of like paying like a person a commission for them bringing capital in. So that's another tool to kind of use in your, you know, in your toolbox basically. Yeah. And, and in that case, you're paying people to go out and find yeah. the, the investors for you. Yeah, exactly. If you ever think of the movie, uh, back in the day, it was called uh, Boiler Room. Kind of yeah. like that, <laughs> where guys hammer out calls, <laughs> or even Wall Street, what is it, Wall Street with uh, Leonardo yeah, DiCaprio, yeah. kind of like that. No, yeah, no, that's it, it, it's it, that's interesting um, that the, that there's more and more of those services out there. And then, um, I mean, if you're if you're if you're looking for capital, obviously it depends on the amount of capital you're looking for, where yeah. where you would look for it. If you're looking for a lot of capital, right? I mean, if you're looking for if you're looking beyond the you know the one to five million, and you're looking for maybe 10, 20, 30 million, are there are, where are the places you should be going right now? I think the family office angle, and then also because I've talked to some people that kind of guided us that that work with them a lot, and they mentioned it's a lot of partnerships. So they're looking for, if you have a really good deal or you have something that's really, that they, you know, they can park the capital, they know that you have the, the systems, the teams, the process, you have access to the deal and you have, you know, you work with their terms and like with the length, it's usually like the length, they usually want a shorter mm -hmm. length than a you know, typical fund, seven, 10 years. They want like a four or five year, kind of like a private equity model. Uh, you're also seeing a lot of sovereign wealth funds foundations uh we haven't done stuff with anything with foundations but foundations they do what they found they uh finance a lot of the private equity uh and you know charity you know, people that have a lot of money and they want to place it where they know they could get like, a nice return and it's passive but go to who has the money like what grant cardone says who has my money <laughs> <laughs> And uh, and given everything that's happened, I mean, now that we're somewhat starting to emerge from this, is there is there a lot of money sitting out there on the sidelines? Yeah, I think uh, right now a lot of people. I mean, it's just like is the time of this whatever this comes out. It's just a crazy time with like you've seen the Bitcoin uh, explosion. Yeah. We know probably hyperinflation's happening. So a lot of people and you know the banks are giving basically nothing in the savings account. So you have people, uh, you know, they have capital parked and they're looking for. And now we know too with the new incoming administration, so the different taxes. So if you have a vehicle or an investment that could, you know, help, you know, if it's a multifamily fund, or we're at mobile home parks, but if it's multifamily or mobile home parks, we have like actually tax benefits. Some people really like the tax benefits and then the equity multiple, like if you hold the fund long term, both of our assets pay down through the, from the, you know, the tenants paying down our mortgage and we increase the value of the park. And then we get that equity multiple kind of hedge against that because you have a place to park your capital while everything else is kind of, you know, crumbling around us. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's interesting sometimes that I'm not sure people are always aware of all the different types of in investments, particularly passive income investments on that, that they can, that they can make. Um, I've recently, I've talked to people who do obviously, um, obviously there's real estate and that, but there's also people who do storage units, yeah, do, um, 5G towers, all of this. Yep. And you do, you do mobile home parks, right? Yep. Yeah. I, yeah. I remember that was a big thing. They sell, you know, you have the farmland or you have a building and you lease the towers. That was a big thing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Self-storage is probably our closest competitor. It's an alternative asset class where a lot of people either have our asset class and then like a self-storage or and our multifamily. It's a very similar kind of niche. Yeah. And just, to, just tell me why, why would, why is uh, mobile home parks, why are they a good investment? And yeah. do you, and what kind of investments do you offer? Is it, I mean, are you buying mobile homes or are you also doing fractional? How do you do it? Just the entire park. So like last year, if you look at the institutional data, Green Street, which is like the biggest institutional data of all commercial real estate, mobile home parks did the best by far. They did about 12% increase in value last year. So in industrial second, uh, multifamily, I think was down 3%. Uh, and you have obviously retail got crushed, malls got crushed, uh, hotel lodging got crushed. Uh, but even in the 10 years, the last 10 years since the last housing crash, mobile home parks are the best. It basically comes down to supply and demand. You can't develop really new parks, about 10 new parks every 20 years. 
Um, and so you have the 60 million Americans need affordable housing and about 12 million mobile homes. So the, the fact that the government does allow new, new development, it's kind of like what Warren Buffett calls a moat. It gives you that, you know, that protection yeah. around your business. So whenever there's a downturn and people, you know, crazy downturns, mobile home parks do better because people they don't have much savings or they lose their job. Well, we're the cheapest form of housing. So for one third the mm -hmm. price of a house or one half the price of a equivalent apartment in the same town and you make 10 bucks an hour or you just have social security, we're the only solution. So you always have that really huge need. And so we go for stabilizing cash flow assets that already have a 30, 40 year, 50 year history of just cash flowing. And then we just bring in more technology and more efficiencies uh, and then, you know, beautify the park through CapEx and better management to improve it. Right. And so if you're buying it, you're buying into the fund, is it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, what are some what are some sources of of capital that you that you think uh, people should probably avoid right now? Uh that's I don't know. I think wherever I mean, maybe friends and family money because it's like if you don't know what you're doing, because <laughs> yeah. uh, if you know what you're doing, then yes. But like always, because you could ruin that a uh, friendship. But that'd probably be the only thing I'd think of. As long as you know what you're doing, and you, you know, you can honestly serve them at a high level. I don't think anything's wrong as long. Well, I guess, you're, I guess this would be the one thing. If you have somebody, if you're looking to your fund and they seem kind of like, they don't agree with your terms or they're calling you every day, or like it wouldn't be somebody you want to work with. And that'd probably be, you know, the people who invest with us are really, everyone's like super passive, but they, they want to see the transparency and everything, but they're not like every day what's going on. Like that would probably be somebody you would want to, you know, yeah, know. and I and I think that goes even that goes also for what you mentioned earlier about the the family offices and uh, and that is that, yeah, you you need to figure out um, the kind of relationship, the kind of people you're yep. working with. Is that is it a good fit? You know, is the is it and do you have a good communication cadence and all of that? Because the last thing you need to do is to is to get into bed with somebody funding wise and then end up in a situation like you just described where where it's just a bad match and you know people are at each other all the time yeah and especially if they're the big you know if they're the one check holder so they basically yeah. dictate so that's kind of the thing and so and we're seeing that this with a single family office not just them we're also seeing the sovereign wealth funds and they're i guess they have really strict terms because it's a lot of like the like oil money there because they know that they're eventually the oil is going to dry up so they're investing a lot into like funds and private equity so but i heard their terms are pretty kind of like you play by their rules basically yeah yeah and to be honest uh, private equity is pretty much like that too yeah uh, um so uh are there uh, so tell me a little bit about um about funds like yours i mean what what are what are the what are the terms for funds like yours for getting into a fund and would you encourage people to look at things like um you know the mobile home parks yeah i think one of the advantages for the everyday passive investor that wants, you know, a vehicle to get, a, you know, ours is quarterly payouts. You get the tax benefits. Our niche is actually the 15 year depreciation schedule. Um, so we have the lowest form of taxation for your K-1. So basically traditional commercial estate is 39 year depreciation. Uh, multifamily is 27.5. Mobile home parks, the land improvements, not the land, but the land improvements, which 70, you know, 70, 75% of the entire park is like cement and like the streets, mm -hmm. all that gets depreciated at 15 years right on day one. So you have this huge write off there. And plus we have the bonus depreciation. Hopefully that stays around. So you get the, you know, the tax benefits and then you get the equity multiple. So the tenants pay down the, the mortgage, the, you know, the note, and then that increases the value and when you sell it. So, and then plus if you want to keep it longer, you can cash out refi in the four or five years. So it's a non-taxable event too. So if you want to realize like a nice big chunk after you raise the rents and bring in value, prove the community, you know, qual you know make it a better quality, you know, community for the people, you could cash out refi in four or five years without being taxed and hold it for another five years. So it's really just about having something that's passive vehicle and having somebody that already has a, the team in place, already has the deal flow. Any fund out there, you really want to have, they have usually, you know, tremendous experience, but they also have the team. Like we have the, the yeah. biggest fund administration software. It's like a hundred billion under assets in our management. Uh, the park CPA is, uh, we have a season park CPA that also works with other funds and also is a you know, top 10 firm. And then our property management, our third party partner has 33,000 lots. They have the most management lots in the country. They do Apollo Group, a big private equity, the second biggest private equity. So basically we build all the, and plus we have access to deal flow and we're in boots in the ground. So they don't have a learning curve. They don't need to go out and learn the business. They just come in, put the check down, 
see the transparency in this collect and get the benefits from it. So any fun out there, that's the key about it. You don't have to go out there, have the headache of being a landlord, go and make the improvements, go yeah. have to like figure out the business model. You just day one, get all the benefits with the, now the work. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think this is a good time. I mean, I think it's always a good time, but I mean, I think it's a good time right now, given the volatility and everything and in the stock market and stuff for people to diversify their, their investments and particularly things like, I mean, when you see things with a solid track record, it's always something worth considering. Yeah. And then we're seeing like a lot of people pulling out from the markets too, just because the, uh, you know, people uncertainty, I think it's, I think, I mean, I'm not a trader. I used to work in the board of trade in Chicago and it used to be right. a professional day trader, but I, it just, I, right now it's basically, I think it's overpriced. So just. And we just saw today or the last couple of days with the pumping on um, oh. GameStop. I mean, so, <laughs> you know, these are things that uh, certainly you couldn't do with the mobile home park. Could you? Yeah, that's, it's, 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 that's a crazy situation. Like, and at the end of the day, retail traders always, I think the SEC will eventually come up with like more, you know, basically before now with all these different apps and like, you, you know, Robin hood and things like that, everyone could get like a little piece of the play at part of the puzzle. But before you had to have a day trade account, like, you know, back in the day of Scott trader, TD Ameritrade is $25,000 just to even be involved or get margin accounts. And like, now it's just like, they've opened up the floodgates. So I think that's, the biggest problem too is that if you know if they start doing that with other you know other stocks and this becomes a new trend it's like I, you know good for some people other people are gonna get hurt they can write it off yeah. But still. yeah no and that's why i think it's great um you know the kind of alternative investments um like yours i think they're definitely things that people ought to ought to take uh, a look at um and what about uh, what, what, for for something like an investment like yours what's the kind of minimum buy-in Sure. Yeah. So it's 50,000. Ours is the lowest with an APREF. Oh, so good. like there's a couple other park funds and I know one has a million dollars for an APREF, <laughs> one <laughs> of our competitors. So we've, we've, uh, we lowered the bar. We have very favorable terms. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really passive way to be involved with the real estate, get all the advantage of it. And like you said, safeguard, have that peace of mind. Like historically the last 50 years, we've been the safest real estate based on bank data. Uh, and we've been the top performing for the last 12 years. Sam Zell, the greatest real estate investor of all time. Uh, he's the biggest owner of mobile home parks. He's also the biggest owner of office and, and multifamily apartment buildings, but he sold off half his office and half his multifamily and he's buying, he's not selling any of his parks. So if you see trends like that, you see Blackstone Wall and uh, Apollo Group, the two biggest private equity, they're just buying billions and billions of dollars the last couple of years and they're going all in in our niche because they know it's a moat and it serves a need and it's the last form of non-subsidized affordable housing. So anybody gets the niche, I know it's a little unique, but at the end of the day, it's like, it really serves that need. And as all this craziness goes on and, you know, with more automation and more technology advances and more people working from home, you're going to see more, more people going and gravitating to parks. And one big trend I didn't mention is they're saying that the baby boomers, the silver tsunami is going to happen and which one third of all single family houses are going to go to the market in the next 10 to 12 years, the baby boomers retiring and selling that off and downsizing. So that way, you're going to see huge influx of, you know, especially in like retirement areas. And then where are they going to go? Well, the, the more fluent are going to go to assisted living centers, you know, five, sure. six, 7,000 a month, but a vast majority of them are going to go to class C apartments and or mobile home parks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes, that makes complete sense. So it's a, uh, it, it's a, uh, when people look at it and say, well, you know, that's been around a long time and it's not that exciting, but as you said, it's a, uh, it's, it's uh, outperformed everybody else and it has a coming wave. Yeah, yeah. And that's, it's now becoming a trend. Now you're starting to see all the news. Like now we have obviously internet, everything. Once something gets big, it gets broadcast through social and everything else. But 15 years ago, you tell your friends or 10 years ago, it was really super niche. And everyone's like mobile home parks. What, you know, what is that? It's the weird asset class. But now even Fannie Freddie. So Fannie and Freddie and now have an allocation of 37% to affordable housing. And we're the biggest recipient of it. So you get the Fannie Freddie terms. We actually have lower rates for the first time ever, lower than uh, multifamily. So we're getting non-recourse, like great agency debt. So that's how much they never even did this five years ago or six years ago. They just first started getting involved in their space. So like, if you've seen the government backing it, and they're saying you can't open new ones, and you see the trend of people moving into it and people downsizing and or the ten to fifteen dollar an hour jobs, it's the only place they could live at. So everything's just lining up perfectly. All the trends and all the, the laws just align up perfectly with our niche. Just perfect synergy at the right time for us. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, I actually know the chief economist at, at Fannie Mae. I must ask him about it. That's interesting. Yeah, that's the, yeah, it's called Duty to Serve, I think it's Duty to Serve Act, I think it's called. And they just changed, uh, they have a couple of new stipulations they launched in about a month ago. So we haven't had any new loans with them recently, but I know they have some news, like you have to have, I think, I don't know, I don't know, don't quote me on that, because I don't know exactly. I know they have had some changes that just happened, like end, end of November, 1st of December, but Duty to Serve Act, it's like 37% have to go to affordable housing, so. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. Well, listen, thanks very much, Jonathan. This was packed with um, great insights. Um, all of Jonathan's information will be below this video. Uh, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and, and what you do. Sure. Yeah. So Midwest Park Capital is my fund. Uh, we're, we're acquiring mobile home parks in Midwest. Also, we like Texas, Tennessee, high growth markets. We have Florida as a, if we could find some off market in Florida, Florida is a little bit lower cap rates. We like the Midwest because uh, higher returns, the, the big institutional money goes to the coastal cities first, and then they come in. So we still have the four or five year run in the Midwest before it gets really compressed and the cap rates get compressed. So serve the affordable housing need. Uh, it's called Midwest Park Capital and Midwest Park Capital is our fund. If you're a credit investor and you want to see the PPM right away, I recommend going to Midwest Park Capital Fund to see more, learn more. Perfect. Listen, great. Thank you very much, Jonathan. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine Pipeliner CRM. Well, I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you for having me on.